Hello and welcome to the second session of the Data and Analytics Day on Devtober Fest Week One. Uh, I'm glad for that all of you are joining uh, live or maybe you are watching the recording. Uh, this session is going to be about machine learning engines embedded in SAP Data Warehouse, uh, Warehouse Cloud. And presenter is uh, no one else but Andreas Forster, who you might remember from last year, the Oktoberfest, uh, as well. If you didn't participate in uh, last year, the Oktoberfest, then all the recordings are available as well, and it is never too late to catch up. Uh, as I mentioned, the Oktoberfest uh, uh, is in its week one right now. It is going to be months long. Uh, event full of uh, activities, presentations, tutorials, uh, fun activities. Uh, you can get points for participating in them as well. So if you are collecting the Oktoberfest uh, points, if you are participating in this contest, uh, then please remember to go and to answer question after the uh, presentation on the uh, session validation page. I will additionally, uh, obviously, uh, paste this validation question uh, URL to the chat uh, later on. Uh, so today's day uh, was uh, kicked off by Christoph Morgan talking about machine learning as well, but in the context of SAP HANA Cloud applications uh, and Python, that session is available um, for you to watch on our YouTube channel already. Uh, next week, Wednesdays, uh, we are going to have uh, sessions around SAP Analytics Cloud, uh, integration with Data Warehouse Cloud, and as well, building uh, analytic applications. Uh, the Wednesday after that uh, will be all about Data Warehouse Cloud, introduction into Data Warehouse Cloud, and as well, uh, SAP BW Bridge, the topic that is extremely uh, popular among BW customers who are thinking about uh, extending their you know, landscape to the cloud. Uh, and uh, the last Wednesday of this uh, month will be uh, about data intelligence. So how to build data pipelines uh, in general and how to use the uh, new features of Python operators uh, in particular. Uh, if you are uh, looking for some uh, more uh, like more technical sessions, then let me just remind you that um, uh, the education content is split by days uh, during this year, the October first. So Monday is all about ABAP, Tuesday is all about user interfaces, Wednesday as today is about data and analytics. Uh, tomorrow. Uh, and all Thursdays of October are about low code and no code tooling. And then Friday is cloud native development. Uh, if you are collecting points, then uh, my uh, teammate uh, Josh shared all the ways in which these points can be uh, gathered, collected. Uh, so I'm going to paste the URL link to this web page uh, in the chat later on as well. Uh, so that you do not miss any opportunity to collect your uh, points. And last but not least, uh, we would like to uh, encourage you to uh, check SAP Ticket agenda uh, that is going to be uh, to have virtual part uh, uh, similar to last year and as well some on-site hands-on lab uh, in Las Vegas uh, in November uh, as well. Uh, so I'm going to share all these links with you uh, in the chat. And with that, I would like to stop sharing from my side and invite Andreas to share uh, his knowledge and his insights about machine learning in Data Warehouse Cloud. Andreas, over to you. Super. Yeah, thanks very much, Vitaly, and uh, hello, everyone. So that's uh, Andreas speaking, Andreas Forster. I'm a data scientist or a machine learning expert. I think the, the titles are very vague, <laughs> very liquid. Uh, I work at SAP in a global center of excellence. I'm based out of uh, Switzerland, but being a, in a global team, really working with a global audience of, of customers and uh, extensively work with the machine learning engines that we have embedded 
in data warehouse cloud and it's really very similar if not identical engines that we have in HANA cloud and uh, maybe you've already uh, watched the session this morning that Christoph Morgan presented now about using machine learning engines in HANA cloud and um, I'm hoping this session really to extend on what um, Christoph Morgan presented uh, looking into the data warehouse specific or data warehouse cloud specifics primarily and also really I, I try to give a, a glimpse overview of how like these engines these machine learning engines can be used even with data that is coming from the bw bridge into data warehouse cloud and a uh, quick look at the agenda um first you know I, I think it's still useful to look into the individual uh, machine learning engines that we have there's an automated approach there's a more manual approach and there's additional engines that I won't dwell into very much today, geospatial graph or, or text or unstructured text held in, in tables in Data Warehouse Cloud. But I think it's still important to point out that they're available, can be used very similar to the above machine learning engines. Um, I want to show a demo working with data that is already in Data Warehouse Cloud, how from a Python interface you can connect to that data, how you can trigger the machine learning engines that are in Data Warehouse Cloud, so really applying machine learning without having to extract the data at all. And so it's, it's my vision also to show how in your own systems you could set this up. We will look at uh, the two aspects that are relevant, how to configure Data Warehouse Cloud to make this possible, but also looking into what is uh, required in your own possibly local Python environment to establish that connection. And then finishing off with that BW bridge that I mentioned, hopefully also if time, uh, I'd like to show a brief live demo on how that can be done. We have time for a Q&A at the end, of course, um, but uh, during the presentation itself, if you have questions, please use the chat. If you're watching this live, um, please ask um, a question. Maybe there's a chance to answer it through. In the meantime, while the ses session is happening, Peter Lee will also be having a look, um, but of course we'll have time for sure at the end um, to, to look at anything that is uh, left open. So starting now with the uh, machine learning engines that we have in Data Warehouse Cloud, and maybe just one brief word on Data Warehouse Cloud itself. So there are a lot of separate sessions on Data Warehouse Cloud, and towards the end um, I will point out to uh, Two or actually three different sessions as part of DevToberfest, which I think will be most relevant. Now, this topic here now is relevant for you. And there will be one session by Klaus Peter Sauer that looks specifically only focused uh, into Data Warehouse Cloud. So I won't go deep here. No, I'll just say one or two words where, in, in a sense, the name Sub Data Warehouse Cloud really says it all. It is a data warehouse in the cloud. It's a service that we're providing, it's a cloud application. Um, which takes business data, extends it with business context. It's giving it a, a graphical user interface, which makes uh, the functionality easier to access, maybe um, to uh, less IT heavy users. So it has an aspect of, of self-service. Of course, it's very much integrated into the business technology platform, into SAP applications, but it's also extremely open to non-SAP data sources on non SAP applications. And looking at an architecture or the sort of analytics cloud architecture from SAP now at, at a wider angle, you can see here the data warehouse cloud is, is very much central. You really see it in the central part here, um, which is which in itself, so it is using HANA cloud, extremely tightly integrated. So if you're using sub data warehouse cloud, it has HANA Cloud embedded into it, and therefore you know, can use the functionality from HANA Cloud. And here, obviously, you know, we'll be using now the machine learning functionality. So Data Warehouse Cloud includes HANA Cloud, but it's also tightly coupled already with SAP Data Intelligence Cloud, where Data Intelligence Cloud, you might know is a data governance, data orchestration platform, which amongst many things you now has a graphical interface where you can create graphical pipelines that do data transformations, possibly data movement, data preparation, where these graphical pipelines already have a first integration into Data Warehouse Cloud. So by using Data Warehouse Cloud on its own, you also benefit from some of the functionality that SAP Data Intelligence Cloud provides. And you now once sort of data has been um, curated, created, maybe enriched through machine learning, 
and, and that could mean that the data you already have in your system from sub data warehouse cloud that this data you know, can be extended can be enriched through machine learning for many many different purposes and the predictions that are created here could either be used live on the fly you know for for real-time requirements or it could be used to create predictions maybe in a time-based process that might run every hour every night the predictions are produced written back to some data warehouse cloud and then become accessible to any application to any use case to any user who requires these predictions without necessarily having to have the skills to create predictions on their own but predictions that are created maybe by by yourselves maybe by it maybe by data scientists but then shared with a bigger broader user base through whatever means you know, is necessary or useful for that use case and that might be sharing those predictions um, through sub analytics cloud you now that many people use as a analytics or, or planning platform and in addition to the numbers you're already providing there of course you could also share predictions created through machine learning now looking at the architecture a little more focused really on that uh, machine learning aspect so looking now at data warehouse cloud which in itself, as you know, includes HANA Cloud. And you now benefiting from the functionality that HANA Cloud provides, of course, now HANA Cloud can use structured data, be it sort of physically stored within HANA Cloud, Data Warehouse Cloud, or be it uh, more sort of semantically connected so that Data Warehouse Cloud knows where to find the data and only loads the data in when requested. Or it could be a real-time replication so data warehouse cloud functionality that ensures now that the latest data maybe from an application like sub marketing cloud transferred in real time keeping the data then in data warehouse cloud permanently up to date stored in hana cloud and now in hana cloud of course you have these engines that you can use you now to enrich the data we will be working with the automated predictive library and in parallel to that the predictive analysis library so very similar names but they do things quite differently and we'll, we'll explain that on a separate slide and then here again you now just for reference these three additional engines that we want to delve into a deeper today but the geospatial engine that allows you to to bring geospatial aspects into your analysis there's, there's a graph engine you could think of it as, as a linked um, engine a social engine and there's also text mining available the ability if you have a written text in, in the table maybe customer feedback or something similar that that data can also be used in a very text specific aspect so this is functionality from hana cloud now made available to data warehouse cloud plus on top of that obviously all the things that data warehouse cloud is providing and just a few bullet points again now that the self-service aspect that it becomes easier for business users now to work with the data and create their own content, maybe create um, their own um, data views. There are data spaces which can be used to separate the projects to make it sort of easier, now almost to find your way around or to work in groups. The business semantics that makes it easier for business users to understand the data. And another aspect, I don't think that I've mentioned so far yet, the data marketplace which is literally a marketplace embedded into data warehouse cloud where you can access external data so data that is coming from outside your own organization data that is coming from outside sap but where you can subscribe to data to enrich your own data sets and uh, one obvious example for machine learning um, is uh, weather data we will be using an example for a time series forecast where weather data is relevant and you could either organize your own weather data that is relevant for your use cases, or you could have a look in the data marketplace of Data Warehouse Cloud if there's already a provider that is providing the weather data suited for your own requirements. So it makes it very easy to consume and integrate. And then you know, once predictions are created, you can share the data. One option is sub analytics cloud, but here it's a very open system. It could be virtually any system you know, that is required to make use of those predictions. And that is where the data is stored. And these are the engines that you can use directly within Data Warehouse Cloud without data extraction. And how is that actually done? Um, this is sort of done by accessing Data Warehouse Cloud 
from an interface that a data scientist most likely is already working with, um, but delegating the calculations to Data Warehouse Cloud. Again, no data extraction. And we have um, two different interfaces for data scientists to do that. So out of the box, there's always the option to use um, an SQL interface, and that might be well suited um, for IT. Now, if, if you're an ex SQL expert, the functionality is there, no, it will remain, but it's not typically the environment data scientist is most comfortable in. So personally, you know, I used to work with R and then switched um, to, to Python. Um, and now I'm almost exclusively using Python. And we created interfaces for both Python and R, which allows you to stay in your preferred Python or R environment, connect with Data Warehouse Cloud, and instruct Data Warehouse Cloud, for example, to prepare data, to manipulate data, to impute missing data, to train machine learning models, to, to create predictions, all that out of your favorite preferred environments. Another logo I've got on here, Dbeaver. You can connect from Dbeaver. So a tool really to connect to and, and manage and work with SQL type databases. But when it comes to the deployment, so when you have a machine learning model you really want to put into production, then typically it's, it's not sufficient to have maybe your own local Jupyter lab that can train a model, that can create predictions, but it has to run somehow, of course, under the governance of the IT department. So it needs a, a profound process that, that works, now that can be supported, that can be maintained, that is not dependent on you not being on, on vacation, that does not uh, sort of depend on, on your laptop being up and running. And for that, we have the sub business technology platform where the content that you're creating maybe in Python, maybe in JupyterLab, maybe in R Studio, can be deployed. And that could be um, Subdata Intelligence, that could be Cloud Foundry, that could be Kuma, um, but it could all be something else. So very, very open, just really needs to be a platform that can deploy either Python code or R code. And with that, looking deeper into the actual machine learning so functionalities, and here first broken down by the different aspects or so sort of very common concepts or categories for machine learning. And I won't go through all of these options. I'll just pick out um, a few that I believe are, are most relevant. Really starting with the classification where in the binary classification, you predict whether something is happening or not happening. You see an example here where it's a, it's a churn that could be customer, the existing customer. Is that customer leaving or is it customer not leaving? Um, one customer recently did a project with a classification that was about the supply chain so reliability, where just once a year they sit down and they look at the existing suppliers and the history and they train a machine learning model to predict the probability, the risk of each individual supplier having supply issues in the following year. And if that is the case of so the probability of that machine learning model, that prediction is fairly high, then they will reach out to that supplier, you know, seek a discussion. Is, is there some truth about it? You know, is that impression correct? If so, what can be done you know, in cooperation and partnership to resolve issues before they happen? So really to mitigate upfront, not having to fix things afterwards. Um, another case here is the regression where you're not uh, predicting a probability, rather a numerical value like a, literally a number that could be a period, um, that could be a number of days, that could be um, a financial amount. How expensive is it going to repair um, a certain car? And if that uh, amount is too high, it might just be more feasible literally to sell that car and uh, replace it with something new. That's a use case someone did. Or the third one here, the clustering, where you're trying to identify groups in something where you don't quite know what makes these groups sort of different from each other. And one customer is using clustering to personalize their communication to their own customers. They have an app which is tracking information about so people's um, sportive behavior or health lifestyle. And they want to provide information that is relevant to these individual users. And while the application is starting up, uh, and they haven't got a lot of history just yet. So they use a data-driven aspect to segment their customers into different groups. Here, they're using that clustering based on how people behave. They identify you know, different people that are somehow similar 
and with the ability then, once these clusters were found, for them to analyze you know, what are these kinds of groups, what makes them different, and then for each group to find a relevant content you know, that, that helps them hopefully you know, to continue a healthy lifestyle. Um, another one, time series forecasting on the right here. So where you have measurements um, that have a timestamp, measurements that keep happening. Um, and here, you, know, you can then sort of try to understand that time series, the patterns, and uh, predict into the future what is likely to happen. And there's just one case I'm coming up at the moment where one customer wants to predict so how much electricity is being produced or is going to be produced by sort of photovoltaic um, devices. There's a, a thousand plus devices, not all of them have a light connectivity. And here, upfront, being able to predict how much electricity is likely to be produced that would help the overall operations. And the last one, I'd like to pick an outlier detection. So where you look at you know, a pool of data and you try to find something that is sort of different um, to the rest, something that appears to be wrong. So, and, and one customer used that on their financial data where, so they wanted to identify unusual financial transactions. And, uh, but they didn't have um, sort of a list of transactions from the past that might have been um, so un in compliant. So here, the approach that was chosen was an outlier detection, trying to find these transactions that were somehow different, to then investigate manually. Maybe things were all right, maybe it was just an unusual transaction, but everything was okay. Maybe something went wrong, maybe a mistake happened, or maybe it could even have been fraudulent. So quite a range of different uh, things that can be done. And you now these sort of machine learning concepts in Data Warehouse Cloud and even HANA Cloud, you know, can be addressed with these two different engines we already briefly mentioned. There is the automated predictive library, which you no, know, the name gives it away, is highly automated. And my personal recommendation would be, whenever possible, to start working with that automated predictive library, because typically in a machine learning project, if it, uh, if it goes live, you don't just need one machine learning model, typically you need a lot of them. And if it's, for example, a demand forecasting, if you have 100 products, well, that is 100 time series a month. Or if you look at uh, a customer, is that person likely to buy a product or not? That is one classification, a classification that needs to be retrained so that over time, that model still reflects reality. It's still as good as it can be. If you want to do that for multiple products, you know, the number of models that you need that just quickly multiplies to do everything by hand would be quite a task. Of course, it needs to be automated. And here, the automated predictive library, this is a very robust proprietary framework to do that. It is proprietary, but it provides a lot of insight into the logic that the model found. So it's, it, it tries to be as transparent as possible. If, however, you know, there is a very specific individual, let's call them classic algorithm that you would like to try out, maybe there's a chance to be even better than what the automated predictive library has provided then there's a wide range of classic algorithms that you, know, you can also use. It, it means that, of course, you have to know these algorithms, you have to understand, so the assumptions under, under which they're working, they need to be configured or parameterized. And if, if you have that, that skill set, then you know, that there's a wide range of additional individual algorithms you can use, either individually, or often you know, combining many of these algorithms into some, some larger project. And, Andreas, slide. Yeah, we sorry if I can step in at, at this moment, but there is a question in the chat and I'm just curious if you know okay. uh, something more uh, from Satish. Is there any use case envisioned specific to NLP, natural language processing as well? Yep, so in this presentation, I'm not talking about NLP, but it is possible. So there's a text analysis engine that would be able to cater for that and um, sort of a to give maybe one or two examples where we've been using that is around the data quality, where one company had um, assets, um, physical assets, it's, it's a railway operator, where it was needed to fill in missing master data. For example, was a manufacturer of a certain asset that was a multi-class classification which could be used and where the text engine came in, that was very handy. Or Another use case could be a classification. If a text comes in, you would like to know, um, for example, is it, um, is it a complaint? Uh, is, it, is it an order or something else? Well, all that would be possible with the engines that are provided by the Data Warehouse Cloud. 
Thank you, Andreas. And sorry for interrupting. No, oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks, Jody. So here now we have these individual algorithms available as part of a data warehouse cloud. And you might have seen the very same slide earlier on today when Christoph Morgan presented you know, the algorithms available in HANA Cloud. It is the, the same slide because Data Warehouse Cloud makes use of HANA Cloud. And the, the color scheme on that slide um, sort, of it, uh, sort of indicates partially when that new algorithm was added to the list of algorithms. Uh, so it's a very much, it's an active environment where we keep adding algorithms based on customer feedback. So, so I find it you know, extremely comprehensive. There, there's a lot here, of course, they're all documented. Um, but if there was anything you know, that, that you're interested in, that, that you're missing here, please let us know. Maybe it's on the roadmap or based on customer feedback. You know, hopefully there's a chance we can add it later on. But again, extremely comprehensive. And now so that uh, you, know, you don't have to use SQL to trigger these algorithms, even though you still could, if that is your preferred way, we created these uh, machine learning clients, they're often called, for Python and R. And these are these interfaces that allow you to stay, for example, in Python, to script Python code, to work very much in a, let's call it scikit-learn style way. So scikit-learn, a very popular open source Python library, where we tried really to be as close as possible to the way of working, way of working that you might be familiar with at the moment. And so use the skills that you already have, but again, connected um, to Data Warehouse Cloud here. And this client, or I often call it the, the Python wrapper, HANML it is called, under the hood is creating the necessary SQL syntax so that what you scripted in Python can be executed in Data Warehouse Cloud, HANA Cloud. And also here, now we try to be very transparent. Typically you have access to the SQL code that is actually created. Usually you don't have to look at it, but you can if you want to, whether it be for, for transparency or some customers use that um, capability almost as a head start to quickly create some SQL code, which might be complex, but often easy created through Python, take that SQL code and then use it in a, in a different context. And also to, to mention again, very often it's not just one algorithm or one APL, one PAL or text or graph no, or, or spatial, very often really is the combination of these different um, modules you know, that make the, the projects extremely interesting. And these um, uh, Python clients here, so that's really the, the most comprehensive um, area, R isn't as quite as extensive, I think it's fair to say, but here the Python library that we're using, HANML, the one at the bottom, this really is that machine learning client. And under the hood, HANML is using the package you see on top, HTTP CLI, which is a native Python interface to connect to actually Data Warehouse Cloud, HANA Cloud, or even HAN on premise. So, so very much everything I'm speaking about here in terms of sort of core functionality, of course, it is available in Data Warehouse Cloud. No, that's part of the session, but also it is available in HANA Cloud and I would say to 95%, it's even available on HANA on-premise. So depending on which platform you're using, well, there's a good chance that you would even be able to use the functionality, even if you were not yet on Data Warehouse Cloud. And with that, I'd like to show a, a little demo where now I will open up um, Data Warehouse Cloud. And first, I'd like to show the data on which I want to train a model before then actually opening a Python interface you know, to, to trigger the machine learning. And I'm just opening up here um, Data Warehouse Cloud system, which has a lot of content. And I'm just going into that individual uh, space here that has the data that is relevant now. And in this space, uh, so if you will see later on, now you can access the data for the machine learning purpose through a database user, which and let me just show that here, um, needs a certain privilege to be able to use the APL, Automated Predictive Library and PAL, but that will be documented later. This is just why we were here, it was just convenient to show. But to actually look at the data, um, I just choose to, uh, to store the data in the Database Explorer. And in here, it's just a, a table that we're working with. It, it could be a view, no, it's 
here it is physically loaded data, but it could also be data that remains sort of just linked and really just connected and external. But what we have is a table called um, marketing. And in this table, we have um, well, existing customers of a bank. Now we know the, the balance on the account. A lot of people are on zero, but if I scroll down, you know, we actually see those with a bit of money in the account. Um, and these people, the existing customers were contacted to promote an additional investment product, like a savings scheme. And in the last column purchase, we see whether or not these people actually did decide to buy that product based on the phone call that was done. Here, you know, what we see right now, people didn't. Eventually, some of those did, and we try to find now the rule, what makes these people different that actually bought that product. And now what I'm using to uh, show that is uh, a local installation of Python running locally on, on my laptop. I'm using Anaconda, where I started a local Jupyter Lab. This is what I have um, open now, Jupyter Lab, if you're not familiar with. So it's very popular with the data scientists. Nothing that SAP developed, but something that we can work with uh, very well, of course. Now, now here, this installation that I'm using, in a way, has nothing to do with SAP, but it will connect to Data Warehouse Cloud. But you could also run these Jupyter notebooks if, for example, you were using subdata intelligence where so they're provided out of the box. And let me just clear the output from a previous run. And I'll start in here. So the gray cells that are the Python codes that I'm executing. And in the first cell, I'm now connecting to that data warehouse cloud that we saw. And um, the clock on credentials are saved securely. We'll see later how that can be done. But I now have a connection from my laptop to data warehouse cloud. And I can start exploring the data. And here I'm using, we call it a HANA data frame, pointing to the table we just looked at, um, bank marketing. But if you want it, you could also use um, an S well, a select statement of uh, complexity of your choice. This, of course, is the most simple that is possible. Um, but in here, just to point that out, if you're familiar with Python, maybe at first glance it looks like a pandas data frame that contains data. Here it's different. You know, it's, it's an HANML data frame that points to the data that still resi resides in Data Warehouse Cloud. And only if you want to download some data, maybe to peek at a few rows, then you, know, you can call the collect command. And then it is downloading the data to which the HANML data frame refers to. And so that you download all the data is always advised now to restrict the data here at five. So take the first five rows of the table and display it so you can see it. And here we're already using that HANML data frame, obviously, now that it's already installed. And that HANML data frame is providing a lot of functionality even to, to explore the data. Um, so you wouldn't just start with machine learning right away. You want to know what is in that table. And hopefully it is big enough for you here to, to look at. And there is a, a Kant report that is uh, here. So providing a lot of information about the table itself. For example, uh, if we go here, hopefully that's big enough. There's a scatter matrix that is always quite useful to look at. So pitching the numerical variables against each other, for example. Um, or so it tells you how many categorical variables you have, um, how many numerical, how the data are distributed. So always useful to look at. But now for our specific task, now we want to train a binary classification, will the person buy or not? So we have to have that information in the target uh, column, remember purchase. When we looked at a few rows, we only saw people who didn't buy, um, but we can see, 5,000 people actually did. And of course, we need these two entities, people who did who didn't buy, so that machine learning you know, can try to find a separator a rule that separates these two classes. And now that we have the data here, now you can uh, plot that data, but still the count was created in Data Warehouse Cloud. And imagine if you don't have just thousands, but uh, millions of records, no, they do not have to be extracted and downloaded. Or uh, a different way now trying to analyze the content of that table. Uh, you see here, for example, that we have 45,002 unique custom IDs. There's no missing value for the custom ID, which, which is important. Um, we can see that we have data for the 12 different months. So there is a month in which the people were contacted, whether they're interested in the savings product. There's a lot of statistics here about, for example, the balance that 
mean. So the average value here is 1,362, uh, what people have in their account. And if there was anything unusual, no, here there is a first way to, to find out um, and yeah, get information about the content. And each value that you saw here was actually created or calculated by Data Warehouse Cloud. And here you have the ability to obtain the select statement that was created under the hood while this described method was being called. And if we just do that here, we actually see the select statement below the table we had. No, massively complex that of course nobody would want to create by hand, but you can take it with a copy paste and bring it into the database explorer. I just need to be able to open it. So if you go in here, go to the SQL console, you have the SQL statement created by Python, it is executed, you have the same result. So just to point out what is happening under the hood, I usually find that very useful. And that could be then SQL code no, that can reuse for a different purpose. Now we are happy with the data, we're familiar with it, and we want to train a machine learning model using the APL or the automated predictive library. There really isn't much that you need to configure. There's more that can be configured. There's still parameters uh, that, that you can pass, but here we keep it uh, you know, very straightforward. We just say um, uh, the target column and the, the ID, customer ID, that's all that's required. And in the meantime, that model has already been created and there is another unified report they're called. Now to look at that model, and this is just coming up here. So a lot of statistics about the report, well, about the model itself, quality indicators, for example. Um, and let me just click here on the variable importance. So part of the automated predictive library um, is a feature selection. So selecting which columns are actually relevant for that question, for that prediction. And these are the ones now that were selected, month being the most important information. And month, if you remember, was that month in which the people were actually contacted. So, and, and that raises the next question, what, what is the month in which you know, that, that campaign was running best? That is additional information that this APL is providing. First uh, as a table, but then let's do it graphically. And in that graph, I'll, I'll explain that's very simple. So on the left-hand side, you see, I have to uh, turn my head, <laughs> December, March, October, September. These are the months in which the campaign was most successful. In May, however, the campaign didn't really work very well. Um, and that, of course, is super interesting you know, for, for your operations. Now, that is a product clearly you want to push in this month here. In May, however, hopefully you have a different message you, you can send to your customers to be relevant. So that kind of that point of contact, you know, use it for, for good purposes, obviously. And that, there's a lot more that is available um, as part of that report here. There's some so internal um, information. When the APL was training the model itself, it already separated the data set into one part where it was training the model and then another part where it was checking the quality of that model. All that is still there and available. And now if we're happy with that machine learning model, we can predict behavior on people we haven't contacted yet. So there's an additional table in Data Warehouse Cloud with people no, that we can still contact. And now for those people, no, we apply that trained model. And for the two customers that are only in that little table, we get the probabilities now of these people being interested in doing a purchase. And that prediction you could now save back to Data Warehouse Cloud where the next process, maybe a marketing or a business user can pick it up no, for further processing. And earlier on in the session that Christoph um, Morgan held, um, there was someone very interested in sub values, which are one way to explain sort of what led to a high or a low prediction per person. Or often it's called local explainable AI, and there are so-called sub values uh, I wanted to show in here as well. Where now for that person where the probability was very high to be interested, we can see that the strongest factor actually for that prediction was the information P outcome, uh, which stands for previous outcome, which is um, an information how that person behaved in the previous marketing campaign, whether that person did or didn't buy a product at that time. And then the day and the month were the second sort of strongest contributors, at least, or uh, the information that had the strongest impact. So all that being available, and obviously at the end, you can save the model to pick it up later for 
uh, for further predictions. So that was um, one way now to use um, the machine learning engines within Data Warehouse Cloud, year run, executed from a local um, Jupyter notebook, but again, from virtually any Python environment of your choice, now this would have been possible. Then coming back uh, to the slides here, I'd like to speak about um, the setup, what is required to actually make that work and um, split into what needs to be done on the Data Warehouse Cloud side, as well as on your local side. So it's three things on the cloud. Uh, you need a system, Data Warehouse Cloud system with three virtual CPUs or more, which means that the free trial that we have for Data Warehouse Cloud is not sufficient, that has only two virtual CPUs, but if you have a productive Data Warehouse Cloud, chances are you know, you're well covered here. You need to activate the script server, which requires a ticket, and you need to create a database user. And on the following slides, there's uh, more information on that. So first, the, the cloud setup with uh, at least three virtual CPUs. And of course, your data was cloud tenant can be configured, the size can be increased. But then to activate that script server, um, this really is just a ticket that needs to be locked um, into HANA on premise. This really is in the, it, it's done very, very differently. Here with a ticket, now we will activate that script server. And only once that script server is, is activated, then when creating a database user, this is done here in the, in the tenant. Once you create the database user, only then you have the option here, enable automated predictive library and predictive analysis library. Um, so here, obviously, tick that box, and then the user is created, and you see the credentials on the right hand side here that are created. This user is then obviously able to use these engines. Now, client side, so what might be required on your own system, or if you use something like, like data intelligence, you need to install that high ML package that I've been using. You have to make sure that your external IP address is on the allow list of Data Warehouse Cloud so that you're not blocked. And there's an option to store your lock on credentials uh, securely in the HANA client. Also, more information in here. So HANML is really uh, easy to install. It's, it's a pip install if you're familiar with Python. It's on PyPy, which is a public repository of Python packages. And uh, maybe I'll just show it briefly. So the easiest way personally that, that I find to go there is literally to type HANML. PyPy on Google is, finds it here. It already has a lot of information, uh, but also uh, it's a very good way to go to the latest documentation of that package, you know, where of course in each class, each function is documented, but also it has two um, tutorials in here on how to use the PAL and the APL. So uh, I think definitely worth looking at. Then the external IP um, address. So here, now this is, in this case now, if I was working as I am from a local laptop, you need your external IP address, not the local one, often starting with 192, and that address needs to be added you now to the allow list there's a screenshot here so you know where to find it in the system configuration um, in Data Warehouse Cloud. And then finally, if you want to store your, your lock-on credentials of that database user that was created, um, there's a way to do it easily and where you can store it in the secure user store, which is part of the HANA client. So on top, you see a conventional lock-on where everything is hard-coded, including the password. And of course, that will lock you on. There's also the option to omit the password, um, the password in, in that option. And then you will get an interactive prompt in Python. And on manually entering that password, now it will use that information, it will connect. Uh, but you still have to enter, of course, um, that password every time you create a new connection. And uh, the secure user store is the place, and you see it here in the command prompt, the, the syntax, where you can store these credentials um, and so refer to it by, uh, by a, let's call it a flag here, my. The WC, and that then later on allows you to simply connect to use that key as I'd done at the very beginning of the Jupyter notebook. So if you go through these steps, now you're ready to go. If you have an existing data warehouse cloud system, now everything, everything should be there. If you have the three virtual CPUs, you're ready to, to set that up. Then coming to the BW bridge, 
Also, yeah, I won't go into a, a lot of detail. There will be separate sessions. Um, for example, you know, Dennis Osroy will be uh, presenting specifically on the BW Bridge as part of Devtoberfest. But really, at a high level, um, the BW Bridge, it's a component of Data Warehouse Cloud. Um, which is there so that content, existing content that you might have in, in BW or in BW4, which are really on-premise applications you know, by core, that this content you know, can be reused, can be leveraged, can be brought into the cloud, into Data Warehouse Cloud. And once that content is in Data Warehouse Cloud, well, obviously it is in Data Warehouse Cloud and it is available to the machine learning engines that we looked at, you know, or graph uh, or spatial or text. And for that, I also have a little demo and I think we are well in time so so I can show that as well. So for this I'm connecting now to a um, slightly different data warehouse cloud system where but yeah, my colleagues uh, kindly set this up for me the content as part of the BW bridge so I myself and you know, by all means I'm, I'm really not a BW expert or BW bridge expert but I don't have to be because my colleagues sort of provide the the data made it accessible to me. So now you know, I can almost like self-service machine learning because the data is there that I can work with it. And here now in the data builder, I see the BW bridge space. And this really is a BW bridge for the data in here. So on, on purpose, it's not directly accessible, for example, for machine learning purposes, not to ensure the stability of the system. But if you create an additional space, you can make that data available. Here, that additional space is called HANML Bridge, but it could be anything you'd like to name it. And we have a view here that I'd like to show and that I will use in Jupyter in a, in a second, where now under shared objects, you find the content that is made available from the BW Bridge, so content initially coming from BW or BW4, and now this object here um, is now exposed as a view in this additional space. And you see the name here, VDemand DevToberfest 2022. We'll use that in a second. And no further modification was done here. You could modify the data further. You could uh, prepare the data in, in different ways. But here, it, it's really just taking that content and making it available to my database user. And the data that is in here is um, so, well, it's data from, from London where we know for, by history of, of years uh, per day how many bicycles were rented out and how the weather was on those dates. And now we try to do um, a forecast on how many bicycles are likely to be rented out in the next two weeks. And actually we can maybe quickly look at the data here. So we have that link. So here we see that history. The, the date and the VW format. We see information about the date itself, like the average temperature. And then on the right-hand side, more information whether the tube, the underground might have been on strike and the target highest, how many bicycles were actually rented out in the end. So now that data I want to use for a prediction. And in here, just opening a separate Jupyter notebook, which in essence looks very similar, obviously, but also here, clearing the content first, where now you see I'm connecting to a different system, got a different um, tag here. This connection was successful. You see how I'm connecting now to that view that we just saw that makes the data available, but without duplication, but it's literally just a view on top. And now here, BW, uh, one or two things to look out for. For example, the date is coming through as an NVAR car. For creating a time series, we really need a true date type, so we can do a cast. And I can do that straight here from, from Python, as you see, I just cast my Z date into a timestamp, and I see the new format here. This hasn't changed anything in, in BW or, or in the BW Bridge or in Data Warehouse Cloud, purely semantical. My HANA ML data frame now treats that column, that date, as a timestamp. And with that now, I look at the content using the same described method that we had used on the banking data. And we see, for example, that um, there's some interesting minus 99. T-min stands for the minimum temperature 
minus 99 T max, same thing minus 99, unusual because here that minus 99 is actually a flag. It's, it's a flag to indicate that we didn't know the true value. Uh, so it's, it's really missing data. And now there's a method for that. So there's a way to do that where we can tell that HANML data frame to treat minus 99 as a null value. And after that transform, if I do another describe, we can see that minus 99 is gone. However, we now have null values. So we can see that for 13 days, we didn't know the minimum temperature and we didn't know it for 18 days. But also we can see here for highest, the target column that we try to predict, that for 14 days, we also do not know the true value. And these are the 14 days we would like to predict. So this data set has a full history where we know how many bicycles were, were hired. We have the full weather data. And then for the following 14 days, which we would like to predict, we also added the weather forecast to the data set, but we kept the target column empty for those 14 days that we'd like to predict. And now, just very briefly, a correlation matrix, now the data has been prepared, and the correlation matrix tells us about the, the strength of linear relationship between two variables. And we see, for example, a pretty strong linear relationship between the average temperature and the number of bicycles that were hired. So the better the weather, the more bicycles were rented. Personally, surprising for me, um, the RCP precipitation, so rainfall with highest only very weak negative correlation. So slight tendency, if it was raining or the more it was raining, the few bicycles were rented out, I would have thought, now that's a stronger negative um, correlation, but uh, no. And with that, we really start training that machine learning model. I'm just aware of time, but uh, hopefully we will fit right in. No, where again, using APL, automated predictive library, we just need to specify um, the data frame now that we're working with here. Uh, I just need to uh, well specify the target column highest, how many days I'd like to predict. Um, I do ensure that the forecasts have to be positive. You know, of course, for that use case, number of bicycle hires, negative wouldn't make sense. And also that is considering the it's called extra predictables, meaning the additional context like the weather data, whether the underground was on strike. And the model has been trained and there's a quality indicator, a so-called MAP. And there's a median absolute percentage error, which means, also simply put, um, on average, the prediction was uh, wrong by 13%. That can be good or bad, not depending on the use case, depending on the status quo, how accurate your forecasts are at the moment. And if you'd like to improve that further, you, you can keep looking for extra predictors that had to describe these days what happened um, on those days in London in that case, so that could uh, then help for increasing the accuracy of that prediction. Now that we have the model, we actually create the prediction for the next um, 14 days. And we'll also see that um, plotted where in this graph in blue, you see the actuals, what really happened um, for that history starting in 2015. And on the right hand side, now barely visible, the blue line is stopping and then only the orange line, the predictions now take over. And it's, it's always good, I think, to see even the past estimated um, by, by the time series to get the feeling for how well that model is working. And you see, so for example, two extreme values in the middle of 2015. This is actually when the underground was on strike. And that is one of the pieces of information or the predictors we had you know, in our data set. And clearly, you know, it made use, made use of these to increase the accuracy of the forecast. Um, and then finally down here, just looking at the actual predictions, so looking at uh, the last 20 rows in that case, we still see six days of history where we know what happened. So here the, the actual column still, this really happened on the 30th of June, um, but then it stopped. And then now uh, only the predictions are available taking over. And it's not just a point prediction, you know, but it also comes with an interval lower and upper bound to give you an idea about how, how confident you can be in the exact range where the true value is likely to fall. And these are the predictions for the next uh, two weeks. And uh, those predictions, you can then save back to the Data Warehouse Cloud. And if we have it still open, you know, maybe we can see it in here, not there, but here. 
So where, where this table now, that is the data now that we predicted now being available for any other process, you know, and, and whether it picks up the data, whether it's a sub analytics cloud or a different process, you know, that person doesn't necessarily have to know where that prediction was actually coming from. It's just, though, of course, important to know it is there. It's, you know, it, it could be scheduled to be produced every day, and then it is set into the following processes. So that's really the, well, the, the content that I had um, prepared to give an introduction into the machine learning engines in Data Warehouse Cloud, how they can be used. And if you have a system yourself, how that needs to be configured um, but to make that work. Uh, I mentioned a few times that there are other sessions that I find super relevant uh, if you find that topic interesting. Um, there was already the session by Christoph Morgan this morning. There are two other sessions coming up specifically to Data Warehouse Cloud and another one on the BW Bridge. And also, if you have a system and you'd like to exercise or go through the two examples that are shown, please send me an email. I'm very happy to share the notebooks and the data. It's all publicly available. So you would be able to exercise that yourself. And if you have questions, no, by all means, no, please reach out, do send an email. Hopefully I can help or maybe some of the colleagues that are with me in the same team. But if you happen to speak German and you want to go deeper, there's actually a book coming up. It is German though. So if you're German, no, that, is, <laughs> that is an option. It's meant to be released um, later on this month, so October 22, if you're watching the recording. And just final word, no, there's a lot more content, of course, the October Fest is just starting, um, leading up to TechEd. So as you do, please browse around. There's so much content. Um, make use of that. A lot of it really is free, of course. And with that, I'm thanking you to, well, for, for listening. And there's hopefully a couple of questions. Yes, thank you so much, Andreas, for a very interesting and technically detailed presentation. Uh, there were quite a few questions, even though they are going slightly broader into like AI, ML areas. So uh, let me share with you and, and check if you can answer or maybe, you know, suggest some uh, uh, references. So uh, one question from Anurag, for example, is, uh, if we have computer vision of stream data processing and analytics available in SAP AI scenarios. Mm -hmm. I mean, th there's a lot available sort of in, in different environments. Yeah, I was really just focused on what is available straight inside Data Warehouse Cloud, which is really structured data, mostly that the system is, is looking after. But there's, there's other components. There's, for example, AI business services that are targeted towards unstructured data that are very relevant for certain business processes. Yeah. So hard to answer simply, but there's a lot mm -hmm. more than what I've shown here in machine learning and data warehouse cloud. Sure. And, and obviously we can once again just suggest as well to check all the AI sessions that uh, will be available during uh, SAP TechEd in November. Yeah. As the, there are quite a few sessions discussing more and broader uh, AI uh, applications in, in, in SAP landscapes. Uh, the question from Satish, uh, does the feature engineering framework provide capabilities for dimensionality reduction? Um, it does, yes. So APL itself is, is doing that out of the box. You can activate it, you can turn it off, you can specify so how many uh, columns you'd like to uh, have, have remained. But also if you're using with PAL, there are also algorithms that allow you to do a feature reduction, yes. Thank you. Now there is somewhat uh, uh, broader question as well from Ravi. Uh, what would you recommend to an SAP BW customer who uses non-SAP machine learning modeling landscape, for example, with AWS or Azure? How does using SAP machine learning tools improve the overall process in this case? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, in my opinion, it can massively simplify the architecture because um, so if you have your data in, in a BW system, I mean, there's always the option on, well, can you use that machine learning, that system? Clearly, if you were bringing it to Data Warehouse Cloud with the BW Bridge, um, for sure. And then if you use these engines that are already there, you, know, you don't need to move your data. And if you were bringing your data to hyperscaler, which of course is, is possible, you have to move that data. You know, it has to be duplicated. You have to keep the data sort of in check. You, know, you have to keep the data consistent. And very often, I believe customers might not even realize that all these engines are already there. 
and that this uh, hopefully would be a first attempt to apply machine learning to the data. And if the algorithms of the framework is there that you require, perfect. And the, the whole architecture you now would be massively simplified. And we even have customers who use front ends such as from, from hyperscalers, but point to the data in the data warehouse cloud and still use the engines in data warehouse cloud. So you can use the preferred interface that already exists, but still benefit from the engines in data warehouse cloud. Sure. Thank you. Uh, there was one more question from Anurag, and I'm afraid that he was um, uh, slightly confused maybe by seeing you to type pip, which is uh, in some cases still associated with Python 2. So the question was simply pip3 or pip? Oh, yeah, under the hood, it was actually doing pip3. Uh, I think there was a pointer or how it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I think I'm using Python 3.9, if I'm not mistaken. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, and then there is a, a question from Satish, even though I, I tried to uh, clarify um, any insight on how model retaining is implemented with this framework. Maybe retraining? Uh, that's what I was uh, like trying to clarify as well, probably model retraining. Yeah, so if it's about retraining, then you really just need a, a trigger to retrain these models. And there could be something very simple. It could be a little Python program, maybe running on Cloud Foundry that literally just triggers. Or if you're using data intelligence, for example, as part of you know, your, your architecture, it could be that as well, or there's many different options. Sure. Uh, OK, there were uh, some, some simple questions as well that I tried to like you know answer in the chat. Uh, to save uh, to save our time, we are uh, over the uh, hour already. Sorry if I took too much of your time with the initial introduction of the October first and and the weekend data and, and analytics track. Uh, so, Andreas, thank you so much for sharing your valuable uh, knowledge. Thanks to everyone joining the session live and as well watching uh, watching the session and watching the recording. Uh, if you still have any questions uh, remaining, I would suggest uh, to go to the uh, session session event page on the Oktoberfest, ask your questions there, and uh, Andreas will be uh, there to answer your question. Eventually, I will ping Andreas if there is any question remaining unanswered there. Thanks everyone for your time and have a good day. Have a good month of the Oktoberfest. Super. Thank you, Vitaly. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.